Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Luhr, and I'm extremely excited to have another good friend of mine with me on the line today, all the way from Silicon Valley, Mr. Peter Hutton. Thanks, Marcus. Great to be here. Uh, great to have you. It's uh, early morning here in Malaysia, but uh, in the afternoon for you. So let's have an interesting conversation. And, and I really would love to start off with just highlighting your, I would call it, colorful career. Um, and then we, we get into the, the nitty gritty here. Um, you started off in the, in the broadcast world, um, but as a reporter, um, you know, as a, in, in, as a commentator and, and seeing from your, from your CV, uh, it was even during your you know high school I guess in and college days so uh, it was really uh, an early start I guess uh, um, but it already showed your passion for the industry um, you then after uh, having an illustrious career I guess behind in in front of the radio uh, or in front of the microphone you moved up very quickly um, you worked several years almost twelve years I think it was TWI obviously the IMG production arm. Um, and that took you all over the world, so I'm, I'm almost certain there are some interesting stories around that uh, and the things you've done there. Um, the first time we, I think, met and, uh, and got in touch was when you were with Touch TV uh, as the head of programming there and later on, of course, CEO in the year 2002. Um, we we'll, can talk a bit about WWE maybe later on. Um, then you keep, kept falling up the stairs here. Um, you ended up with Fox <laughs> International and ESPN Star Sports. Uh, in very senior role, including the managing director, uh, for a short period here in uh, in Singapore, when uh, when they were re, uh, I guess reorganizing the entire company, it became Fox Sports Asia. Uh, from Singapore, you moved to London. Uh, a short period it was an agency there, who we all know uh, shall remain nameless. <laughs> and then uh, you had a couple of you know almost three or three to four years with Eurosports as the CEO, worldwide CEO there, based out of France. And now here we are uh, in, with Facebook, Director of Sports Partnerships in California. So you've literally worked all over the world, and, and therefore I'm sure that it will give you, gives you a tremendous perspective. Uh, but you come and originally come from Leeds, so I'm sure we'll have a, an interesting <laughs> connection to all that sort of side of it. So that's Peter Hutton. So welcome to the podcast, Peter. Thanks, Marcus. It was a long, a long journey to get here, but it's it's um, it's certainly been an interesting route, and I'm I'm very proud to say that I've never had a proper job that I've always worked in sport. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Now you, uh, I know. I mean, we know each other long enough, and we know the the passion you have for it, and and uh, and the amazing things you've done. So, as we do in our podcast, we always kick it off with a bit of a nice story, and I, you know, you have so many stories, I'm sure. So I'll leave it to you to just take that away. Uh, honestly, I, I could tell you so many stories, and um, uh, the, the danger of being this old is I feel I tell the same stories all the time, but probably the best period of my life for stories was when I worked with Football Mundial, which was a, an IMG soccer show, and we, we set it off yes. in 1993, um, mm-hmm. and it ran for 20-odd years, and I had a, the first year um, I was the producer of that show, so I, I got to pick lots of places to go to and lots of things to do. Um, and saw some amazing things. And, and actually, the most remarkable thing was how many times it went badly wrong and the amount of disasters that I had along the journey. And somehow you'd come out at the end of a week of filming in a country with some sort of story. Um, <laughs> among the disasters that we had, uh, we went to Cameroon to film Roger Miller before the 94 World Cup. Okay, yeah. Arrived in there, you know, full of plans of a week of shooting things in Cameroon. We were arrested within the first hour of getting out of the airport for not having the right filming permit and right. spent a week under house arrest, which I have to say wasn't as bad as it sounds because we were living in a five-star hotel in the, in the middle of Guala, but we weren't <laughs> allowed out of the hotel. And then on the last day when we thought everything had gone wrong, uh, they let us out. Uh, Roger Miller played his comeback game. We filmed his comeback game oh. and uh, he, he met me just before the game, worked out that we'd come all the way from London to film him. And when he scored, he came and danced right in front of our camera so we get a great shot of him and then invited us back to a party at his house in the center of Douala, which went on to like four or five o'clock in the morning. Um, not a great amount filmed after midnight, I have to say, but it was a brilliant party and, and a great example of how that show just took you to amazing places. You know, we filmed yeah, in absolutely. Palestinian camps, we filmed at the Mandela election, went all over the world with, with football as the excuse. Um, and it was a great way of setting up uh, another sort of 30 years of traveling. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, that is a great story, and I know you have probably plenty more from those days. Uh, and, and I, you know, I know, I remember the show. It was a great show, and uh, and I can only imagine how it was behind the scenes there. But um, since we are, you know, a lot of times we have very young audience here, you know, uh, university students. Tell us a little bit how you did this, you know, how you worked, you know, or got yourself into the sort of world of sports when you were a student. Uh, just a short one on that. I think it would be great to hear. Honestly, I got a really lucky break. I mean, I'd always been a kid obsessed with sport, and my dad is a, is a huge sports obsessive and still is today. Um, and I'd go around watching sport with him all over the country from a really early age. And when I was at school, our school was one of those places where they said, we're going to organize two weeks work experience for you when you're 16, um, where would you like to go? And I said, can I work in sport? And they had a connection with the local radio station in Leeds, which was BBC Radio Leeds. Yeah. And the guy who was sports there, Harry Grayson, let me follow him round for two weeks making coffees and, and generally being annoying. Um, <laughs> and at the end of the two weeks, he said, do you fancy reporting on a local cricket match? And this was a sort of match with you know, a crowd of of children and parents, um, right. but they put the report on the radio. So I did a report from the phone box in the bar at this local cricket ground. Um, awesome. And the next day he rang me up, said, look, if you fancy keeping going, you can keep doing it every weekend. So I kept going. And from 16 onwards, spent basically every Saturday and Sunday and then more and more days during the week um, reporting on sport. Um, I switched to the local independent station for more money after about three four months i moved up from five pounds a game to 15 pounds a game but obviously it was worth the transfer um and then just and never stopped uh, all the way through university spent my time at university sort of driving up and down the country commentating on soccer and rugby league and cricket for all sort of stations all over the country mm. um and then went full-time uh, just before my finals commuted back and forward for my finals and um, somehow snuck through um, and then just kept going. Awesome. Yeah, and I think that's a, it's just such a great example of how it, it's it's so difficult to get into our industry in some sense. But also, if you just be a bit creative and and find uh, find these entry points, then uh, you know, let's see where where it can go. Amazing. I love it. Great stuff. So that that was just very nicely nice way to warm up our session here. Now I want to jump a little bit uh, ahead now in in your career. Uh, and talk a bit about your roles and you know some of the largest sports broadcasters in the world, uh, ESPN, you know Star Sports here in Asia, which became Fox Sports. Um, obviously, your time at Eurosport. Um, tell us a bit about uh, you know what it is, what you saw already. You know, this is obviously now the last sort of let's say ten years period. You know, what did you see happening? And you know, when you were in uh, ESPN Star, of course, there were challenges there. Uh, let's talk a bit about that. Uh, you know, the, the the traditional world still of broadcasting. Yeah, I think um, so. My, my sort of traditional broadcasting falls into two sections, really, where I started off as a as a commentator and presenter at Sky and, and BSB, which was sort of forerunner of Sky in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and that was right when satellite TV started. I genuinely was there as one of the first employees before we went on air. Um, and it was a total disaster, you know, and within <laughs> a year we, we all got sacked. Um, and uh, we were told we were merging with uh, the other bit of there was BSB and there was Sky as rival companies and our bit was BSB mm. um, our bit failed, we all got sacked Vic Wakeling, who was the news editor that had hired me as a presenter was the only guy who kept his job and went across the Sky Sports in, in London um, and we all got sacked and then two weeks later um, I went on holiday, came back, message from Vic got hired again by Sky and ended up working in the, the sort of incredible success story that was Sky Sports. Yeah. Um, so that was a nice bit of living through the sort of pains and struggles of, of pay TV right at the beginning. I think the struggles of pay TV now are very different. Um, but the uh, and, and, and the, the bit that was great for me is that I was there for the launch of 10 Sports or Taj TV in 2002, where... Yeah. We had a sort of successful pay TV story, rose the growth of pay TV in, in India, yeah. um, and ended up building a really good business out of it. And then, you know, I ended up coming back and working for Fox and for Eurosport, which is part of the Discovery Group. And you're part of a world now where pay TV sort of clearly has got challenges in terms of continuing that inexorable growth 
and has to reinvent itself in a few ways. Mm. So different periods of the pay TV cycle. Um, and now I think it's a really interesting period in that cycle where the inexorable growth is not inevitable. Yeah, I, and I totally agree. I mean, I think, well, the pay TV time you were talking about, that's almost 30 years back. Here in Asia, pay TV really is a 20-year journey, um, and that has dramatically changed as well. Uh, I think I remember reading somewhere before, uh, it took Sky, I think, more than 10 years to, to, to make any money, right? So it wasn't a sort of, you know, overnight success. It was a 10-year overnight success. Now, of course, it is, and, and everyone talks about it. But it, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of money. And I think now where we're in the world of OTT, uh, and we're seeing, again, similar things happening, right? Uh, OTT platforms are not making money. They're going to be struggling for quite a while. Um, but is it is is it the future, and are we seeing something similar to what we saw in in, uh, in the pay TV world? What what's your read on that? Um, you know, when you compare yeah. those two platforms, it's a really interesting comparison. You know, you look at what we were at the start of Sky, and we worked out of a warehouse in Australia that was seen as a very unglamorous place to be, mm. um, and you definitely had that sense of, you know, is this going to be around in six months' time? And, and now you go back to Ostley and it's these incredibly glamorous plush headquarters. Yeah. And I think you do get the same sense out of some of the OTT players in that the funding is there to start them up, but the funding isn't necessarily there to make them economically profitable at this point. So there are some gambles to be made. I think as career, though, that means that you get opportunities. You know, And, and the great thing about being part of a startup is that you really learn the industry. You get a chance to sort of throw yourself into all sorts of um, possibilities in a way that a conventional developed industry as pay TV is now means that you have to take very small footsteps. So there's, there's definitely potential for people to get involved in OTT, make a difference and, and create a career for themselves. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Now, uh, before we go into some other areas, uh, one thing I've always, this is a conversation I had many, many times, is that when you are a traditional broadcaster, let's say you Fox, you are uh, ESPN now, and everyone is starting their own OTT platform, which they have to. Uh, but this debate about how you're cannibalizing your traditional business, right? If you are a pay TV operator and you're making your money still uh, through distribution of your platform, uh, and let's call it in a, in a traditional sense. And now you have this OTT play where you're going directly to the consumer. It, you know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that you're cannibalizing yourself. Where do you see that? I mean, where, I mean, we're in these broadcasters, and what was the struggle, you know, in Eurosport or in ESPN to say, well, where do we really go? How do we protect our margin on one side, but also at the end of the day have no choice to go directly to the consumer? No, it's certainly really tough, you know, and it's a real challenge for a conventional broadcaster to reinvent itself. I think as a result, you need very clear leadership at the top. And one of the things that I always admired about David Zaslav and J.B. Perret at Discovery was that they understood that need for change and that idea to focus on direct-to-consumer and to use the strength of, for example, the Eurosport brand or the Discovery brand to build a direct-to-consumer business. Mm. But there are clear trade-offs to be made. You know, Effectively, you're turning a hugely successful, profitable pay TV business that's based on you know, so many years of growth and saying we have to be prepared to take losses, to take a long-term vision and we're building something for the future that is not economically proven. So I think that's a real challenge of leadership, both in terms of sending a message to the external market and your funders and the stock raisers, but also in terms of keeping your staff with you and saying this journey is worth doing because it goes against the instincts and the daily practices that your staff have built up over a long time. So big challenge for a, a conventional broadcaster to reinvent themselves um, and some are doing it better than others. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's uh, it would be really interesting to see what Disney, of course, is doing with uh, with Disney Plus and you know ESPN. I'm sure will have a major role in that or, or a major part to play. Um, yeah, the, the verdict is still out. I you know we started our own OTT platform many years ago, and and I was convinced that is the future. Um, we've seen uh, it, it's it is the future, but it is a long road <laughs> ahead there. So uh, yeah, it isn't as simple as it sounds like. Um, streaming is one side of it. Um, and just, I want to touch on that for a minute because you are obviously from the UK and, and I'm assuming you would have uh, uh, paid attention to Amazon streaming off the Premier League recently. Uh, quick thought on that. Uh, what do you think they're doing? And, and uh, you know, no one coming from you know, a similar, I guess, uh, Silicon Valley background, they're uh, your, your neighbors. What are they up to? 
Oh, look, I actually sent a message to Alex Green at Amazon today saying what a great job we've done because, you know, to do sports streaming is something that really tests the nerves in that you've got so many elements on the chain that can go wrong. Yep. Um, you're not necessarily in control of all those elements. There are third parties involved in the process. And to get through your first sort of big week of live football and the attention that you get during that week is, is a big achievement and, uh, and quite a relief. Um, so great to see they came through it, you know, and also great to see the numbers that have come out about how many people signed up for Prime Video as a result of that. So you've got a potential long term way of sustaining investment on sports rights out of that sort of um, two week experiment really in the Premier League. Um, and the fact that you now see Amazon as a buyer of French Open rights in France and the Champions League in Germany means that hopefully it's part of a much bigger experiment. Yeah. Um, and, and nice to see, you know, that that actually coming through. You get so many bad stories about streaming in the sort of early days of any platform. Um, to get through that first week is quite a challenge. I totally agree. I didn't see the numbers. What, what was the what did you what did you see in terms of what was the conversion or uh, I think it, they've, they've described it as one of the best weeks ever for Prime Video in terms okay. of new signups, and I think that that's all you can hope for. You know, if yeah. if people sign up and they stay, and obviously churn rate is a big factor in this, yeah. um, then hopefully they'll be back for more sports investments in the future. For sure. Uh, now, again, their business model, as we all know, is very different. Right? We talk about e-commerce here, and and at the end of the day, the content is there to drive people to the platform, and then you know there are many many other ways to monetize it. Uh, you know, now we're slowly moving into your world now at Facebook. Um, you know, your world, of course, is very different. But uh, do you see really that Amazon, that is the that's the only play? Just get more people in there so they, you know, you can buy more products? Or do you really see they want to be a, I don't know, the word broadcast is maybe even wrong, but they really want to be a content delivery platform? I think, you know, one of the learning things that, have taken from Facebook and you know we've got a lot of really good people around that are able to teach me about these things is the power of video to do other things you know I think the danger of coming from a broadcast background is you see it in a very straightforward fashion you know, the value of video is about how many subscriptions you sell what your advertising return is on that whereas I think when you look at this from a Facebook perspective you understand that video unlocks a whole range of different experiences you know first mm -hmm. and foremost it helps bring you a next generation of audience and it helps change behavior in the way that sport was always done um and you know we sort of see one of our key roles at facebook as being about audience development and bringing a new fan to an event to a team to an athlete then you've also got the potential now of commerce and conversion where the idea that you're going to buy online is clearly sort of deeply established now but also that idea of using platforms like whatsapp and messenger to turn into transactional um, channels that feel comfortable to an audience you know that unlocks revenue in itself and then fundamentally who's watching that video what messages is that sending out the idea that if someone watches um, a minute of video of your content, they're a natural fan, they're a natural acquirer of premium elements. So as a result, there's a potential there to turn them into a deeper level of customer, a deeper level of engagement. And I think that links both Facebook and Amazon in that the signals that are sent out by being a video consumer are really the fundamentals that build a different way of looking at the industry. Mm. Yeah, good, great point. Now, I wanted to touch on a little bit, um, again, the traditional world with the world you're in now. Um, where, where do you see the difference? I'm sure, I know you have so much data that uh, you will probably would have, a, you would have a very good answer to this. In terms of the live stream and someone truly sitting there for the full you know, hour, hour and a half in football or you know, in American football is three hours or more, or, is it really, you know, where is the future of that? Or is it in that shorter clip? Is it in the, you know, bite size uh, things, which all I really want is show me the goals or show me the, the major action? Where, where do you guys see that heading? I think there's different answers for different age groups, different demographics, different locations. And one of the things that's fascinating is seeing how that plays out around the world and how that audience behavior is changing. Mm -hmm. Because for example, one of the things that we're, we're really keen on is if you're gonna watch sport on Facebook, we want you to have a better experience. 
We want this not to just to be the same as television. We want you to be able to chat with your friends. We want to be able to see you to buy content at the same time, to have a genuine uh, multiple touch points with that content. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you have to recognize there is an audience that doesn't want that, that they want the, the clean screen, the big screen, the widest possible screen available in the room, and to have a very sort of authentic um, old TV experience, if you like. So yeah. I think you're, you're building a range of options so that people have choices and people have optionality. And as a result, you're building something that is a better way of consuming. Um, and for me, that's the key to the future. You know, a lot of it could well be about short clip content. And, and we know that it's a, an issue getting a younger age group to sit in front of a screen and consume yeah. passively for a longer length of time. So maybe the clips become shorter, but also maybe the experience becomes more active. One of the great things about being at Facebook is, is seeing what's happening with the VR world and the AR world and, and talking to the guys that work in Oculus in particular and seeing the range of possibilities that is opening up as the developers look at what's possible with VR and AR so that you become part of the experience of the sports game and not just a passive receiver of that sports event. Yeah, that, uh, completely. I think uh, yeah, exactly AR, VR, in my view as well, completely will change um, the way we all consume sports truly being in the game, um, having the, the angles which you want, you, or even, you know, cameras on the players and, and you know, having the experience of you, you feel like you're running with Cristiano Ronaldo towards the goal or things like that. I mean, I think it's going to be unbelievable, um, the trend there. And I don't think we're that many years away from that, some of those uh, sort of things. What is there something you guys are in Facebook working on? Is that sort of you guys really looking at the production side as well or really more how it gets distributed at the moment? No, I think, you know, what we do on the production side is far more about um, suggesting best practices and encouraging people to become publishers on their own. And, and that's not just teams and leagues, but also athletes themselves to yep. create their own content and speak directly to their audience. But I think if, if you look at that uh, VR world and the speed at which it's developing, um, it becomes something that Uh, could be a natural part of a viewing experience. You know, with, with Oculus venues at the moment, we have a product where you're in a headset, you're watching a game, but you can chat to like your friends or in a different country watching the same game and have a social experience as if you're part of the, the crowd at a stadium. And That's then you've awesome. got the options of which view of the game you take and the rest. But that idea of being able to watch with people and have a sort of shared community feeling um, around being at a sports event, I think is really interesting. Completely agree. Yeah, and, and I think that's anyone, I think, going into OTT or going into uh, away from the traditional, there's a screen and the screen talks to you and the only thing you can basically do is make it louder or, or switch it off. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was exactly the reason we went into OTT because I saw yeah. there is the opportunity to start communicating to the audience, right? Communicating the fan or the fan commuting back to you in a sense. And To me, that is the most important part. And as you said earlier, that's obviously one of the features already you, ha you guys have on Facebook. Uh, so uh, now um, going a bit into some of the other, uh, the way you, have, I was recently at one of your conferences here where we met in KL, um, and there's obviously a host of other toys and tools, so to speak, which you're mm -hmm. offering to rights holders um, um, or, you know, whether it's an athlete or, or the federations or clubs uh, for them to use and play with Facebook. Uh, maybe talk us a bit through some of those fun things you have and, you know, from sponsorship to, to other, uh, you know, e-commerce opportunities. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we'll start with sponsorship, right, because... I think one of the, the bits that you've, you've always led, led the way in Asia, Marcus, is, is the idea of opening up different ways of monetizing content. Um, That's right. And I yeah. think <laughs> if, you, if you look at Facebook and Instagram, that idea that you're able to target specific audiences, but also then potentially attach yourself to the, to the IP of the sports world is a really logical fit. So, you know, we're doing work with people like Etihad and Manchester City about targeting audiences. And it's a logical continuation of, you know, how can a sports brand really unlock what's strong about that brand and make their sponsorship more effective and more dynamic and talking directly to an audience that the sponsor wants. Um, so working with those branded content tools and seeing the measurement of the success of those branded content campaigns, you know, is a really interesting part of what we do. But I think, you know, one of the things that I really like about the job at Facebook and, you know, it's, it's definitely a really different world to me, is that sense that 
you're there as a consultant to the sports industry. So you're saying, look, what are the problems that you are trying to solve? Is it a piracy problem? Is it a next generation problem? Is it trying to make more money out of your sponsorship deals or make the sponsorship deals feel more effective? You know, those are the sort of challenges that sports brands bring to us. And then we can say, okay, if you look at Instagram, this could be part of your solution. If you look at WhatsApp, this could be part of your solution and give a range of different options and sort of hold the hands a little bit of the sports industry as it goes into that journey. Um, I think our role, you know, and there's only 50 people work on sport in Facebook around the world, which is another big difference to my old world. But the, those 50 people are genuinely experts. And the idea is that we're permanently being educated on all the tools within the system. Mm-hmm. And then you bring them to the sort of premium sports brands and say, we think this will be working for you given your challenges. Um, and, and that's, you know, a nice and a fulfilling part of the job. Very different to the old world I came out of, but but at least you feel like you're, you've got a positive legacy out of what your advice can be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I, th- I think I see that clearly that's the approach at the moment, not trying to, you know, whatever, uh, be a broadcaster or be or, or competing with uh, with the current c- ecosystem, but adding value to the ecosystem. I think that's sort of how it seems to be the message from Facebook. But love to jump into that for a minute. Um, and it could have been before your time, so I, you know, uh, tell me what you know about it. But obviously, we've seen Facebook try, you know, a, a dipping their toes into content or, or buying certain rights, as well as maybe bidding for rights. I think it was in India, um, maybe not successful in that time. But it, what was really is—is is there a strategy at the moment, or is it sort of a bit of a trial and error, almost a bit like what Amazon is doing there in the UK? I think, you know, one of the things at Facebook, and you see slogans on the wall at Facebook all the time, but the fact that we're 1% into our journey is sort of regularly drummed into you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're making um, experiments. And yeah. those experiments are really about sort of building case studies, understanding what's possible, and seeing where behavior will lead. Um, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. We've, we've made some investments in sports content, but I think those investments have been about specific examples and we learn from those examples all the time you know and you mentioned the clips and the highlights and and that sort of seems a natural fit a lot with what how people use facebook you get people coming back to facebook you know 18 times a day and as an average number um and therefore getting up to date clips and catching up with what sort of um relevant to their life um is a really good fit with sports content so you know, you, you look at those things, you look at the right length, you look at um, how that potentially can monetize for a sports organization um, and learn from the experience, you know, and, and that's a fascinating journey to be on. Yeah. And, and you know, talking a bit about from our part of the world and a, and a region you know very well, India and what you're doing there with La Liga. Can you talk a bit about um, some experience or some of the learnings you, you guys uh, got out of that? Yeah, I think, you know, with La Liga, we show every game live in La Liga. So as a result, you know, that sort of fits with one of the mandates that I think is important to us, which is, you know, make it a positive experience. You know, you don't want to be taking things away from fans. You want to be offering them more. And traditionally, La Liga would show maybe the Real Madrid and Barca game on TV in India, and, and that would be it. You know, this way, you've got every game there. And, and maybe that's not a massive incremental audience, but it makes a big difference to the teams in Spain because yeah. they want to build their fan bases in India. You know, India is clearly a key market for La Liga. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've taken the gamble of putting all the games online because they see it as a natural way of building that young audience that can be a core part of La Liga's story for the future. Um, so I think that part of it's been good. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we've done, we just moved the production from Dubai where it was in the first year to uh, India where it's uh, to um, uh, Barcelona where it's being built out of this year and again you know you learn technically you learn how to make it a better product Um, Media Pro as an organization bring all the feeds from every game every camera from every game to one hub in in Barcelona and that gives us a bit more optionality in terms of what we can make available and it's it's little steps like that that you, you learn from um, what works, what needs to be done better. Um, and, and it's been a positive experience. And it's great to talk to, to Javier Tebas and the guys at La Liga about how they see their Indian experience because now they've got more and more fans online in, in, the, in an area where they clearly want to make a big difference. 
um, and they can see the proof of that. You know, they know what their audience is. They've got specific numbers that back up their instincts. And I think that's something that they've, they've definitely valued. Mm. Now, I have to bet, I couldn't quite, can't quite call, is it a, let's say, partnership where, you know, they, the, they, you're not paying for it or is it a, you, was it a rights acquisition? I mean, most of the deals that we do are basically they're paid deals um, with a revenue share element to it or a partnership part of it. And, okay. you know, I think at the heart of the way that we approach the industry, it's a partnership approach. You know, that our, our whole division that we're part of is called media partnerships because yep. the idea is it's a win-win. And we talk a lot about um, almost like a Venn diagram of what the sports industry's needs and Facebook as an operation and, and where we meet in the middle. Um, because genuinely, you know, this should be something where both of us win out of it in the end. And, um, and that's sort of, you know, our, our aim with a lot of the sports work. Right, right. And so, I mean, I have to ask it because I'm, everyone else will, will kill me if I don't. So do you, is Facebook going to come in there eventually writing some big checks here? I think, you know, the, the key message really is that you, you look at the majority of sports content on our platform, whether it's live or not live or premium or not premium, and, and it's not paid for. It's organizations putting content on our platform to solve their business needs. You know, it's right. been great to see the NBA putting live games out in the Philippines this year. Mm -hmm. You know, and the Philippines is a great market for the NBA, but they've seen it as a logical way of building another a generation of audience, of talking to different fans and building for their future. Um, so I think, you know, our, our place is um, in a place where we're really trying to improve the industry's position to try and help them build a future you look at something like the ufc in germany where you know ufc couldn't go out on german broadcasters because of local broadcast law Correct. they help build a fan base by putting games out in germany um, and as a result you know you, you've now got the ufc much more popular in that territory so i think we're far more in an area where we're trying to provide solutions you know and uh, and hopefully we get some good stories out of it and we can build on that. You know, one of the bits about the job that I like is that you go around the world and you're, you're permanently telling stories, but you're telling stories about this has worked for an NBA team in the States and this has worked for one championship in Singapore. And, and you're sharing that knowledge, you're encouraging best practices and, and letting people build their businesses on the basis of that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, uh, and again, sticking a bit to the commerce side of it, um, I remember there was some story about um, you know, how you're driving traffic. I think there was a story about the L.A. Clippers uh, and how they capitalized um, some of the new signings and, and then selling jerseys. So there is money to be made, which I think that's where I'm, you know, you know I'm the commerce. I was in the, <laughs> as you said earlier, trying to figure out how, to, how they generate new revenue streams for sports. So where do you see at the moment where, you know, Facebook is not writing a check saying here is, you know, millions of dollars for your content, but where do you really see where, where Facebook is adding that value, not just from a, eye, eyeballs, for sure you obviously have a huge audience globally, but from a true monetary point of view, where's the hook here marcus you're always sniffing out the money opportunities i think you know you look at things like the season ticket sales in particular and the, the selling of jerseys that we've got you know with the clippers there was like 130 million people tapped and revealed product tags in shopping posts on instagram mm. um, every month you know and wow. the sports partners are definitely looking at that trend now you know the la clips clippers um got some big sign-ins in and Kawhi leonard and paul george and then new jerseys the moment they became available they were shopping them out to fans and, and Instagram shopping generated 40% of their total traffic on their online team store that day. So mm -hmm. you know, it's proof that you can generate real money by using those tools. You know, you yeah. look at teams that are selling season tickets by retargeting anyone who's watched their videos and, you know, they watch the clips, they're a logical buyer of a ticket for a game. You look right. at people like DAZN or ESPN or WWE, they put out clips on the platform, look who watches those clips, and then retarget them to become paid OTT subscribers. So there's gen definitely a whole range of different ways that people can go on a journey become, to become a fan and then to become a deeper fan and potentially a monetized fan. Mm.
Yeah, a great example, and, and I think that's what that's what what I what I'm trying to get out here is that you know that that the Facebook is not just a huge platform, but you also have you know what do you call them sisters or part of the family with Instagram and WhatsApp, which are equally you know massive. I, I remember the numbers; everything is in the billions here. Um, how do you integrate these pieces? Um, you know, you really offer that um, the, all the th let's call it just the three platforms we we're just talking about. Um, you bring them together to the parties, or it's really up to them to ch pick and choose where they feel they can play with. Yeah, I think you know it's it's up to the parties to be the publishers, right? And we just provide the advice. But the good right. thing is, you know, I think. And any sports team I've been part of, you know, in my team, kids teams, anything, they've always got a WhatsApp group or a messenger group. You know, you, right. you look at how that has become a normal part of sports fandom. Um, you know, you, I watch a game online. I'm chatting in a forum. I'm talking to friends about the game. You know, the, the social activity is clearly a natural part of being part of the sports industry, if you like, or being a sports fan, if you prefer. Um, so as a result, we know that all these things are definitely parts of the story. You know, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, Oculus, Facebook, stories as a, as a product are all really natural fits for sports fans. Um, how do they all fit together? How is the long-term route? You know, there's still plenty of questions to be answered, but but I think if you see people's behavior and the way that they're consuming sports content or the way that they're showing being a sports fan, you know, we, we know we've got a role to play there. Mm. Do you see uh, WhatsApp becoming even more active in it? I mean, you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with WeChat and, and Line, which have slightly different route um, yeah, um, and obviously come from a different part of the world. Do you see WhatsApp going a bit into that similar direction? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, WhatsApp is an amazing product. You know, the numbers involved in it are just staggering, you know, and um, yeah, you saw me as I did my road show, you know, I go around the world sort of um, talking about where WhatsApp is and Facebook is and Instagram is. And, and I always start with like numbers of people on the platform and daily active users and things like that. Yeah. And the remarkable thing is, you know, you go from week to week and month to month and those numbers are, are okay. changing been, been and increasing sure. and, and you know, WhatsApp is just so much part of my daily life and my family's daily life and fans of Derby County's daily life with me um, that you know it's part of the story, you know, and it's just a question of saying, look, how's the fit going to come? Um, where, where does this um, genuinely drive sort of business goals as well as social goals? But certainly in terms of deepening the engagement as a fan, that ability to chat while watching a video feed or listening to an audio feed it's a natural part of what we do now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, I want to just uh, change gears a little bit. Um, as we talked about earlier, you had a very, very illustrious and colorful career. Um, love you to share a little bit about, you know, some learnings you had. You know, what is it, what really um, allowed you to continuously, I would, what I called earlier, you know, climbing up the stairs here or falling up the steps um, to the next level and level? What, there must have been, you know, what, what is the secret sauce you can share with us? I think being born lucky is probably the key thing, but but you do make your own look a little bit in terms Absolutely. of particularly look, looking for the people that you work for, you know, and and how much you can learn from them. And and I've been really lucky the sort of quality of mentors and and people that I've worked with. I mean, you you knew me in a period when I was working with Chris McDonald at, at yeah. Ten Sports, and Chris's sort of drive and focus on making that business a success yeah. was something that was awesome to watch close up. You know, you look at people like Bill Simrich, I worked with the IMG that, you know, oh, yeah. genuinely made a big difference in changing the business um, nice. down to the people that showed faith in me in local radio, you know. And I think looking at organizations, looking at opportunities where you think I can learn from them, I can mm -hmm. learn from the people that I'll be working with, you know, is, is a really important part of any career step. You know, Dan Reed brought me into to Facebook and. Um, and genuinely not a job I'd thought about, not a, uh, a company that I'd particularly thought about. And then you met and, and he sold you the story and you see how impressive he is in terms of dealing with people above him, below him, around him. And you think this is a guy that I'd like to work with, you know, and, and I think really important that you, you look at the quality of people that you're going to be working with and therefore the opportunity that you have to learn. Fantastic. I love that. That's a great message. So it's not just, you know, you're lucky that you have a good mentor. You actually, you know, when you, when you get, whatever, when you look at a new job, you look at, is there someone there I can learn from and, and he can take me to another level. That sounds like it was your approach. Is that correct? 
Oh, definitely, you know, and I think also just a willingness to take a little bit of a jump occasionally. You know, I mm. think I've I've got a lot of respect for the people that still work in organisations in Yorkshire, which which I left 30 years ago, and and the sort of motivational ability that they've got in terms of to drive themselves to do the same job basically for all that period. You know, yeah. and, and this is not to knock them. I just know that I'm different, right? And, yeah, and I've got a, a shorter attention span and a and a sort of um, uh, a desire to keep moving um, and as a result you know I, I, I've taken a few gambles and, and most of them have worked out um, so uh, you, you've got to be willing yeah well, that, that's uh... occasionally but I think you know yeah you know but you've done it as well Marcus right you know the story that you, you, you've permanently reinvented and, and traveled to do so and, and I think it may, means that you you build a an interesting case study of stories and that helps you in in life in general that's for sure. Yeah, I, I think we're. I'm restless too. So that's for sure what drives me. Keeps driving me here around Asia. Um, now, that that was. I love this. It was a great story. Now, I, I would like to also touch quickly on. You know, I'm sure there are certain things which didn't quite work um, in your career or, or in life in general. Uh, what what are the, what's, give us an example there? You know, what is a regret or or where you where, where you learned a hard lesson in a sense, right, uh, from a, from a failure. Oh sure. I mean, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> there's definitely been sort of moments when you think, okay, that sort of reached the end of its journey, you know. And um, I was really lucky, really, in terms of the ten sports job, in that um, we sort of said, look, we're going to build it up. We'll sell the equity in it and and give yourself um, a, a decent return out of a job like that. And it worked, mm-hmm. right? And and that changed my financial position, and it meant that I was able to walk away from jobs if I wasn't enjoying them. And wasn't you know believing this was going in the right direction, mm. um, and you know did so from Fox and did so from Discovery in the end. Um, and again, I I did it with with good places to go to. But um, I think there's also a recognition that uh, maybe I'd gone as far as I was going to go in that sort of profile. And I think it's important that when you realise that you're not enjoying it as much and you can't see the sort of the next two, three years with any degree of confidence, then you don't want to be that guy who's sat there complaining and, and grumbling and not satisfied. Um, and I think, you know, if you recognize that there's a, a tough six months coming, you have to either be prepared to genuinely lead other people through that or prepared to walk away at a point when you're not necessarily being a negative influence. Um, and I think that's an important learning as well, you know, that. Um, be there when you're going to help. If you're not going to help, get out, move on, do something else. Yeah, I know that's a, that's a good point, and, and I'm sure there we could go into more specifics there. But uh, we, we're also sort of slowly here getting to the the finish here, which is great. Uh, we had a good, nice pace here. Um, as a kind of you know, what we call a cool down period. Uh, Tell us a bit about other parts of Facebook. You know, I want to I want to hear about you know you know have you ever bumped into Mark Zuckerberg or or some fun some fun Silicon Valley stories here. <laughs> uh, I mean, the place is remarkable, right? And and completely different to any other organization, partly because of the scale of it and the size of it. So, you know, I, I often go cycling between different buildings here to go meet people in different buildings. And some of the cycle journeys can take like half an hour to get between building one and building 100, you know? And wow. <laughs> the scale of it is remarkable. The free food is, is staggering. Um, it's definitely my kids' favorite job in terms of the job I've had because the, the food is great and the toys are great. Um, you know, there's a, a room here which is full of um, machines for, for playing games on, and, and you often go in there and see sort of a lot of the engineers chilling out and, and playing on all the machines for the day. Um, and just a different culture. You know, it, it's the, the, the main street at Facebook feels a bit like Disneyland, similar sort of design. Um, and, uh, you know, pe- people genuinely seem to have a smile on their face. And um, that's a really nice part of the job and, um, you know, makes you feel like you're working somewhere special. And, uh, you know, this is, after all the big points we've made, I'll make a really boring point. You know, I think that real estate matters and, and the atmosphere in a building matters. And what I love about Facebook is that they're dedicated to a culture, you know, a culture of openness, of flatness. It's a very young culture. Um, but they want to make people happy to go to work and to do the best thing one of the things that and your assessments here are every six months one of the things that you're assessed on is 
are you doing a job that is suitable for your skills? You know, are you happy with what you're doing on a daily basis? Right. And that matters here. And that sense of a, of, of a culture that is distinct and remarkable to Facebook is, is a big part of, you know, the, the way that we operate on a daily basis. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it, it definitely sounds like a fun place to hang out. I've, I've never been there. Unfortunately, maybe one day I'll, I'll have a chance to visit you there. Um, now, of course, Facebook and, and the, the entire infra infrastructure, is, or, or the other, including the other platforms, is just growing and growing still globally. Um, I, you know, there doesn't seem to be an end to it. Um, what is the biggest fear? You, you send, is there, maybe there is no fear in the company, but uh, you know, what, what, what do you, where, do, where does Facebook feel is a threat out there uh, which someone one day could be the next, you know, big thing. I think the danger is that you slow down. Right? The danger is that you don't permanently reinvent yourself. And, you know, again, I'll, I'll go back to that comment that there's plastered on the walls of Facebook, that the job is 1% done. Mm. Um, and there's definitely a desire to permanently be challenging the norms, to invest in lots of different areas. You know, there's thousands of people here working AR and VR, yeah. you know, which clearly is, is a new business, a new industry. And that's the bit that really excites you about the company is that permanent reinvention and that permanent look forward. You know, we were in meetings the other week where someone talked about looking to the post smartphone generation, um, building for that generation, you know, and that's the bit that is interesting. And I think, you know, you asked about what's the danger. The danger is not looking forward. You know, the danger is just doing what you do. And, and this place is permanently looking forward. Mm. Yeah, no, and I think that's a and also probably a great way to to sort of start wrapping it up here. Where, from all the things you see, and, and maybe certain things you're not even allowed to talk about, but uh, what where do you see is potentially the next big breakthrough um, coming out of Facebook or Instagram, etc. I think you know it'll be based on on certain fundamentals that stay true to um, whatever it is we do. You know, which is based around community. The idea that you're building products that bring people together. You know, Mark Zuckerberg does a a Q and A every week. You know, he stands out in the main square at Facebook and answers questions from all levels of of staff, all ages, all all um, countries. Um, and he goes back to mission statement all the time. And mission statement is building things that connect people. Um, and that's really core to what Facebook in all its different shapes and forms, you know, from Instagram to WhatsApp to Messenger to Oculus is all about, is building tools that connect people. So I think if you think about the future in terms of doing things together, actively participating in content, you know, that's what we're gonna be about for the future. Um, and that's what it's fun to build. Yeah, that, uh, definitely, and I, and I think the yeah the, the the mission of building things to connect people that is that's what sports is in the first place, right? And I think that's why it's so powerful um, to leverage the platforms you're working with, and then bringing something which is already doing it naturally, right? That's what sports is all about. So it's the ultimate fit, and must be the ultimate playground for you, of course, to play in there as well. Um, so. Peter, thank you very much for this for this uh, for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Learned a lot of things. Um, it's always fun talking to you, buddy. And uh, you know, hopefully, we can do it again uh, on some more topics here. Marcus, you know that we'll end up working together on multiple things and talking on multiple things. It's just part of the process. And hopefully, see you soon. Definitely. Have a great day there in California. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Luer Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Luer. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.